You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. As far as the district potential as a whole, we've only really begun to scratch the surface. And, you know, Bill, your question about where we're going to spend the money, um, it, it, we're in a really good position right now because we haven't been in this position where we've been cashed up, where we have $140 million to focus on the district. And that's what we're really looking to do. It's how do we create value for our shareholders? And I mean, all of our shareholders, so South 32 included, in terms of finding more in the district. And we think there's lots of satellite deposits. And we also think think there's lots of opportunities at Bornet. So that's what's really exciting right now. And uh, we think it's going to be a fabulous uh, drill season this year. Thanks for tuning in to Mining Stock Education. I'm Bill Powers, your host. And joining me today is Tony Giardini, the president and CEO of Trilogy Metals, one of our longtime sponsors. We're going to be talking about the copper markets and how Trilogy is advancing in 2021. So Tony, welcome back onto the program. Bill, thanks for having us. A good time to be here and uh, uh, and looking forward to updating everyone on the Trilogy story. Excellent. And let's start talking about the Trilogy story in the context of what's going on in the global uh, copper market and in the copper mining sector. There was an interesting discussion on Twitter that I was following that I would like to throw out to you for your discussion. Uh, one of the points that was made was that there's not just a scarcity of great discoveries, copper discoveries, but there's a scarcity of capacity to build large scale projects. And you could point to a lot of discoveries from the last copper cycle that are not moving forward. Uh, the person wrote, finding copper porphyries hasn't been the problem, but finding strategically large, high quality deposits that are developable is the challenge. So you're developing a copper deposit. Uh, what is your commentary in light of what you're doing with Trilogy Metals right now? Yeah, I think we're really fortunate in that um, two, you know, really key points. Uh, one is we're in the state of Alaska, which is a great jurisdiction. Uh, that's probably the most important thing. The second thing is that we have a high grade deposit. So if you look at Arctic on a standalone basis, copper equivalent is 4.2% copper equivalent grade. If you compare that to some of the other projects that are out there, they're being talked about, they have 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0.5% copper. Some projects are considered high grade if they have 0.7% copper. So we're very fortunate in that we have a high grade deposit and that puts us in a really good position uh, in terms of moving the project forward. So this is a project that um, would have been developed a long time ago had the key piece of infrastructure been in place, and that's the road into the Ambler Mining District. And uh, the, the big thing that happened last year in 2020, in July, was that uh, the BLM granted the final permit uh, to Ada, who's building the road, uh, for a development of the uh, road into the Ambler Mining District. So that's a key to unlocking value. Had that road been there, had the permit been there, Trilogy went own uh, an interest in the in the district because someone else would have put their foot on it a long time ago. And then a key thing I think you've taken care of that a lot of these other discoveries that haven't been moved forward is that you have a partner, right? Cell 32 is spending a lot of money to advance this. Yeah, it is. And and I think, you know, the point that, that was made in in that Twitter group that you were talking about is 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 very valid in that these projects um take a lot of time to uh, build. The capital uh, on them has increased uh, substantially. Our capital amount, our initial capital on uh, Arctic is about $905 million. It's not insignificant, but it's reasonable relative to the size and scale of the opportunity. And Bill, I think the other key aspect of our relationship with South 32 is that they've already effectively validated this deposit in many respects. They've invested $200 million in Trilogy in the Ambler Mining District, $145 million to create the JV, $30 million as initial money that was spent on exploration. And then they own just over 11% of Trilogy stock as well. So they've done the due diligence in terms of the technical nature of this deposit. And what we're focused on now is uh, additional discoveries in the district and the district potential as a whole. And we know, you know, we, t we often talk about Arctic, but we don't talk about Bornite. And maybe as the discussion uh, goes on, we'll, we'll get into the Bornite discussion a little bit more because I think that's one of the things that investors probably aren't paying enough attention to. Tony, before we talk about the exploration potential and these deposits, uh, a couple more things about South 32. What is their cash balance sheet like? You know, just so people can understand how much cash they have for a potential buyout. And then what is their stated goal and their company issued reports and MDNAs about their partnership with Trilogy? 
Yeah, I, I, I haven't looked at what their cash balance is at the South 32 level. I mean, at the JV level, we're at about $140 million. So that's sufficient to cover the next four years of operations at the JV level. South 32 has just completed the sale of its coal assets in South Africa. So their cash position is actually quite strong. And they're really reassessing where they want to uh, deploy their capital. And I would encourage any uh, listeners, viewers to uh, go to the South 32 website. They put up a presentation recently talking about their strategy and what's interesting is they do mention arctic and the amblin mining district in a number of slides and one of the key slides is when they talk about the metals that they produce and they identify copper now they don't produce any copper but they talk about exposure to copper and they talk about arctic and the amblin mining district so i think uh, and they clearly state in their strategy that they want to move to green metals and they want to move to base metal. So I think we fit in quite nicely where, where South, uh, South 32 wants to go in terms of base metal exposure. And uh, I would say it's been a great partnership uh, between uh, the two of us so far. And we're very both very focused on um, the district and uh, exploration potential uh, in and around Ambler. Uh, the last point that I would uh, mention with respect to South 32 and, and how they're looking at the district is that um, they they recently staked an area which they call Roosevelt, and that's an area that's just outside of the Ambler mining district. So it's 100% owned by South 32. So they're in the process of conducting their own exploration on there, and they've got a camp set up this year. They're going to have 30 people on the ground. Now, I'm not here to sell the South 32 story, but I am here to sell the Ambler Mining District story. And the fact that they've staked this additional ground close to the road potentially brings another separate party into the equation to help pay for the road and demonstrates how people are looking at the district and the, the significant upside potential within the district. How it ultimately plays to what their intentions are, well, that's, you know, I can't really comment on that, but I, I think it, uh, it definitely indicates that they are looking at the district potential uh, in the Ambler Mining District. So let's talk about how you're going to further explore. You mentioned Arctic and Boronai, two deposits you know of. What's the plan over the next two years for exploration and who is advancing this plan and why are they qualified? Yeah, that's, uh, that's really the important question right now. And I would say that, you know, the current year is well defined. We're going to spend uh, $27 million this year uh, at site, 14,600 meters of drilling, 7,600 meters at uh, Arctic. Uh, and then uh, near-term targets, we've got uh, additional holes planned on the near-term targets. And then uh, we're going into the district as a whole uh, where we'll, we'll spend uh, an additional uh, uh, portion of the, the drilling will be done on the district potential. So we've got three distinct areas that we're looking at. That. And um, the biggest constraint that we have is really beds and the number of people that we can have on site. And we have a fairly limited drill campaign. It runs from uh, May to September, maybe into October. So we should start to hopefully get some results out in September. And it's going to be really exciting because we didn't have a field campaign last year because of COVID. So this year, when we look at it and benchmark it against other uh, drilling campaigns, is probably one of the largest, if not the largest, drill campaign that we've had uh, in the Ambler Mining District. And I would expect similar size and scale of drilling to occur in 2022, although we haven't really decided where the targets are going to, um, uh, we haven't identified the targets at this point. Although I would say there's a strong likelihood in 2022 that we'll probably do some drilling around Bornite. Whereas this year we have one hole planned between Arctic and Bornite, an area that was last drilled in the 1970s, just to give you an idea. And it was in mineralization. So we think it's going to be interesting to see what comes out of that. Um, and then as far as the geologists and the team involved, we've got uh, really three teams. There's a team at Ambler Metals, and it's headed up by uh, an individual that's been there uh, over the last uh, several years. And so he brings a lot of district knowledge and understanding of the area as a whole. And he's the first and that's really developing the plans. And then we have a trilogy team and a South 32 team. So we leverage off of South 32's considerable bench strength and their team in terms of thinking about the same type of questions, where should we be spending our money? What are the real opportunities in the district? And then on the trilogy side, we have a couple of individuals as well that are working uh, hand in hand with uh, Ambler Metals and Trilogy. The two individuals at Trilogy, or uh, Ambler Metals and South 32, the two individuals at Trilogy, Richard Goss, Richard has a lot of exploration experience uh, worldwide, in fact, and uh, Richard and I worked together back at Ivanhoe 
in uh, from 2006 to 2012. And then we brought in another gentleman called uh, David Broughton. His specialty is actually um, uh, the African copper belt. And when you know, we're not in Africa, but Bornite actually looks a lot like some of the deposits in the African copper belt. And so what we've done is we brought David in uh, to help connect the dots between Arctic and uh, Bornite and to think about how Bornite was created and the size and scale of Bornite and where the opportunities are. Uh, David has had tremendous success. He was one of the co-discoverers of Kamoa Kula, which uh, Ivanhoe just put into production uh, this past week. And so he has a lot of experience with these kinds of deposits. And we're hopeful in terms of using his uh, uh, his his thoughts on uh, where we should be looking at drilling and uh, further opportunities. Um, as far as the district potential as a whole, we've only really begun to scratch the surface. And you know, Bill, your question about where we're going to spend the money, um, it's it, we're in a really good position right now because we haven't been in this position where we've been cashed up, where we have 140 million dollars to focus on the district, and that's what we're really looking to do. It's how do we create value for our shareholders, and I mean all of our shareholders, South 32 included, in terms of finding more in the district. And we think there's lots of satellite deposits, and we also think there's lots of opportunities at Bornite. So that's what's really exciting right now. And uh, we think it's going to be a fabulous uh, drill season this year. Tony, uh, you have cobalt. I believe it's 77 million pounds of cobalt uh, at your Bornite project. Have you been able to do any advancements in terms of the metallurgical work to know what you'd be able to recover from what you have? Yeah, it's early days there, and uh, we haven't really focused on that. I mean, the drilling that we did at uh, uh, in 2017, 18, and 19 confirmed that there was a cobalt resource, and that's why we have a 77 million pounds. The next steps will really start to do more work in terms of how we could look at the processing of that and the potential recovery, which isn't certain, and it's something that we would have to focus on. But the good thing is there is a sizable uh, uh, resource there, and it's just a question of how do you get paid for that cobalt that will likely uh, be in the copper concentrate that's produced. So that's something that ultimately we'll be looking at. And, and you know, I'm glad you brought up Bornite. Uh, Bornite, for, for those uh, listeners that don't know, is uh, 180 million uh, tons uh, at roughly 1.6% uh, uh, copper. And um, it is a reason South 32 originally came in to the Ambler Mining District. They focused $30 million of exploration on the Bornite uh, deposit with no focus really on Arctic. And it's only when Trilogy came out with a resource or a PFS on Arctic uh, in 2018 that the focus shifted to Arctic. So Bornite's a great deposit in and of itself and it's got size and scale and as i said we're hoping to connect the dots between bornite and arctic this year it's about a 20 kilometer distance between the two and if time permits we have a couple holes planned uh in an area called partner hill and cosmos hill which is right adjacent to uh, bornite so we see lots of potential at bornite and we don't think the market has given us any value for bornite at all they've sort of discounted the value and the value is focused um on uh, Arctic, but Bornite is a substantial deposit in and of itself. At Arctic, uh, I know you did the feasibility study, but copper was not as high as it is right now. So what is the current MPV with the copper price where it is? And also what would be your timeline for production? Can you kind of give us the multi-year outlook for Arctic? In terms of the MPV and uh, the, the Arctic project, it's, uh, Arctic is a VMS deposit, which means it's volcanic massive sulfide. So it's not just a copper deposit, although copper is uh, the primary metal. It's a zinc, lead, gold, silver deposit with copper as well, copper being dominant. And that's what really makes the economics of the uh, project interesting. So when we look at the feasibility study, which was released last year, uh, at an 8% discount rate, it had a $1.1 billion MPV, and it had an IRR of 27%. Cash costs were 32 cents after the credits for the other metals. We used a $3 copper price. We used the gold price of 1300 and a silver price of uh, $18. Uh, Zinc and lead were fairly close to the spot prices at the time. So fast forward a year, and with copper over four fifty, gold you know close to nineteen hundred dollars, silver twenty six twenty seven dollars. Um, the MPV of a project eight percent discount is now two point six billion dollars on an after tax basis. Uh, incredible increase. Uh, the IRR after tax is forty five percent, and the cash costs are actually negative. 
28 cents after byproduct credits. So that's really the polymetallic nature of a deposit that's driving it. And that's really what is, is exciting about this project. The other thing is that it, right now it's a 12-year mine life. And with the exploration program, we're hopeful that we'll be able to extend that mine life considerably. And the goal is to, to do just that. And so if we're in a position to extend the mine life considerably, two things happen. One is we obviously get the MPV of the cash flows from past year 12 onwards, but we also defer the reclamation costs associated with reclaiming the my site to the back end of a mine life. So you see two benefits occur from an MPV IR perspective. So I think we're in a really good position at Arctic. Uh, and, you know, coming back to the comments right at the beginning, it's high grade. It's in the state of Alaska, 4.2% copper uh, uh, copper equivalent. Uh, we think it's it's a spectacular deposit, spectacular opportunity. Uh, and the, the key factor that we'll also be focused on this year is the permitting of the mine. So that permitting process is starting uh, this summer, we expect. And we see that permitting taking sometime between 30 and 36 months to complete. So that puts us towards the end of 2023, early 24, to make an investment decision. And at that point, that's when we would expect to start construction, actual construction of the road as well. So the detailed engineering on the road is starting now. We have an agreement uh, Amber Metals has an agreement with Ada to fund 70, up to $70 million over the next three years on detailed engineering. So a lot of stuff's going to be happening other than exploration. We're going to be moving the project forward. We're going to be moving the permitting forward. We're going to be moving the engineering forward on the project and the road, putting ourselves in a position to make an investment decision um, end of 23, early 24, with production commencing sometime around um, 27 or 28 in terms of when we would expect to see ourselves being in a production scenario, assuming everything comes together on that basis. Any commentary you can provide as the CEO of your recent share price action? Copper stocks have been hot this year. How do you view Trilogy's performance relative to peers? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And it's timely. We just traded our 52-week highs yesterday. And uh, I think we feel like we're in a really good position. But I, there's a couple of things I, I should add. I mean, last year, we were really we really underperformed. We had a great year last year. We formed the JV. The $145 million came into the JV. We released the results from a feasibility study. Uh, the, the, the details, the permit for the road came out. We put a management team together for Ambler Metals. So a lot of heavy lifting happened last year. But we didn't have a drill campaign because of COVID. And uh, there was a large seller in the market who was liquidating a position because they had redemptions. And those th two things hit at about the same time. And so we underperformed. And we did a cleanup trade of, of that position in November. Stock in the U.S. traded around a buck forty. I participated in buying about two hundred thousand shares myself at that point at a dollar forty-five. Most recently, I just exercised some options, um, another one hundred fifty thousand options, and I continued to hold those shares. So my position, including uh, 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 deferred share units, is over eight hundred thousand shares right now. And I, I think you know what's happened now is people are focused more on the developers than they are the producers. They're still focused on the producers because that's where the cash flow is, but they're thinking about the companies that haven't moved. And because we hadn't moved, I think we've had a very positive move in our share price. But as I said, there's still a lot more um, uh, upside potential, particularly as we start to get our drill results out uh, later this fall. And also as we start to um, look at Bornet and people start to appreciate the value proposition with Bornet. And so having a project like Arctic with the, you know, we, we own 50% of the Amber Mining District, so it's not 2.6 billion to Trilogy, but half of that. But putting ourselves in that position, having access to Arctic, having Bornite, and having significant exploration potential, I think it's going to drive a good story. I think there's a lot of upside associated with the share price still. Excellent. And any, as we, as we conclude here, any questions you've been getting from investors that you'd like to address as we conclude? No, I think I think the focus is really about you know how how is the state of Alaska to operate in, and you know there's a lot of misconceptions in with regards to the state of Alaska. State of Alaska is very positive with respect to the mining sector. I, I spent part of my career at uh, Kinross, and uh, I was involved with the Fort Knox mine, which had been operating since the 80s. There's a number of other um, large scale mining operations in the state of Alaska. The, the government, the state government, the senators, congressmen are all very supportive. We have a lot of support within the state 
Um, the biggest consideration for us is our partner, Nano, and we have a strong partnership with Nano, which is a native corporation, which represents the native communities uh, in the northwest part of the state. They have 14,000 shareholders. Uh, they're ultimately going to be partners in these projects financially. They're going to benefit through net proceeds interest that they will receive from the development of any mines that occur in the district. So when we think about the development of a district, we think about Nana, we think about the road even being a private industrial use road only, and we think about how um, we want to limit any impact in terms of subsistent hunting and fishing in the traditional uh, area of, of, of Nana and, uh, and the stakeholders in that area. So that's that's one of the big factors. And we're very fortunate that we have the relationship that we do with Nana and that they're um, aligned in terms of this project moving forward, which I think is a big differentiator from some of the other development projects that are out there, whether they're in the U.S., Canada or elsewhere. Well, thank you, Tony. The website is trilogymetals.com to learn more. And the ticker symbol, very easy, TMQ in Toronto or New York on the big boards too. So it's a liquid stock, very easy to take a position. Tony, really appreciate this thorough update. And I look forward to touching base with you again. Bill, I appreciate the interest and uh, I'm glad you gave the ticker symbol and uh, the website. Uh, I certainly look forward to providing future updates in terms of uh, where things are going with Trilogy. Thanks again for having us on your show. Mm -hmm.